de Brasília Física Society. É, aí a Alessandra Tomal, member of the Scientific Committee. É, it, and it's a honor to introduce the speaker, Dr. Albert Bradin. Thank you, Albert, Albert, for accepting your invitation. And let me introduce your first. Uh, he's a senior scientist at the Euro European Synchrotron Radiation Facility, uh, ESRF, in Grenoble. After he got a PhD in physics for a pioneering work on the development of X-ray phase contrast imaging, uh, he moved to ESRF, and after that, became responsible for the biomedical X-ray laboratories such as imaging and radiotherapy with synchrotron radiation. Uh, his research activities focus on X-ray image techniques for 3D and for the biomedical diagnosis performed in vivo, ex vivo, and in vivo, uh, in vitro, and original radiosurgery and radiotherapy methods using X-ray microbeams sync synchrotron radiation. Uh, his uh, scientific results have been published in more than 108 papers. Uh, and since it, uh, 2016, he is a fellow of the American Association of Medical Physics and member of the editorial boards of several journals in the field. In 2018, he was Award with the Outstanding Scientist Prize by the Italian Association of Synchrotron Radiation uh, Research. So today, uh, Albert Brodin will talk about 4D high resolution diagnosis imaging and micro radio surgery methods with synchrotron radiation. And we are very excited uh, with the talk. Albert, please, uh, the floor is yours. So thank you very much, Alessandra. I would like to thank all the organizers and the attendees of this conference. Um, I actually, I hear some noise. Okay, much better, thank you very much. So it's a real pleasure to be among you today. And this will be one probably of my last presentations uh, as member of the European Security Radiation Facility because uh, in two months I will move uh, to Milan in Italy uh, because I just been nominated as professor of applied physics at the Bicocca University. So it's a real pleasure to, com to complete, if you want, this long, long work uh, with presentation of the Brazilian uh, Physical Society uh, that I never attended, never been in Brazil, but I hope to uh, in, uh, in the next years to be able to, to visit you. Um, so, uh, the, the outline presentation includes synchrotrons and synchrotron radiation properties, in particular for the young uh, scientists attending uh, this presentation. Then the way to look inside biological samples in three dimensions. So I will talk about tomography. And I will focus specifically on the X-ray face contrast tomography technique, moving from ex vivo to in vivo applications. Then in the second part of my presentation, uh, I will deal with the microbeams from brain radiotherapy and radiosurgery. Also this technique is applied to synchrotron radiation facilities, which is uh, really the focus of my uh, presentation. And then I will try to give some conclusions and perspective on my work. So since the discovery of X-rays around 1895, the evolution of the X-ray generator went quite slowly until something new happened in the 60s when a, a new circular accelerator appeared. This is called uh, um, ADA, uh, TNFN ROM, Anello di Accumulazione in Italian. And this has boosted the, uh, the development from one side and of two types of machines. On one side, we moved uh, in clinics to the Ansfield machines in the 70s. On the other side, to development of much larger um, 
facilities where this radiation that was created inside of this anello di accumulazione or, or small synchrotrons have enlarged quite a lot to become kilometers from the original a few meters um, uh, circumference. So what is a synchrotron in very, very short um, um, words? So is a source of X-rays produced by relativistic electrons and, and which has some specific characteristics. First of all, is extremely intense. It's probably the most intense X-rays on Earth. Secondly, is highly collimated. So uh, in the vertical direction is collimated like one over gamma, where gamma is the relativistic term. So it's a quasi laminar beam. It's brilliant. So means that there are a lot of photons in a small surface. Okay, and this allows to focus the X-rays, which is not very easy with other type of sources. And last but not least, the X-rays which are coming out are so intense that it is possible to select individual energies or actually better, small bandwidths of energies that can be used to, um, um, to irradiate or to image a sample with an optimized energy. So around the world, there are several synchrotrons, about 50s, and they are disseminated uh, in all continents, including Africa, where a synchrotron is being built in South Africa nowadays. But there are four larger facilities. Uh, one of these is where I work, is the ISRAF in France, is the European facility. Then it's Petra Free in Germany, APS, uh, near Chicago and Spring 8 in Japan. These facilities have a, an higher energy of the electrons and have the, have the largest uh, circumference among the different synchrotrons. And normally the X-rays coming out from these facilities have of larger energies than the, all the other synchrotrons. As average, in these large facilities, you can reach more than 100 kilo electron volts, while in the small synchrotrons, normally you use about 10, 20, 30 kilo electron volts at maximum. So if we look at the Grenoble from the top from Google, we'll see around uh, in the middle of two rivers and going closer and closer, we discover, which is the biomedical being line is where I work. And it's quite long, as you can see. So it goes outside the main ring where the all other beam lines are located. And this is to profit from uh, the, the fact that the beam has a small divergence. So you can uh, um, have a large beam covering a full chest, a full human chest or body in general, only going far away, which means about 150 meters from the source, which is placed uh, below uh, this, this, uh, uh, this picture. Okay, this is uh, another view from far. You can see different laboratories around the synchrotron. So we are in a campus with the neutron source as well. And this is Virology uh, Institute and uh, the uh, COA and other important institutes around. So we are very well placed from this point of view for the interactions with the other type of science. So if we focus now on the biomedical wing line where uh, I, I have carried out most of my experiments along my 20 years in Grenoble, we have a first experimental arch where we have the most intense beam, which is closer to the source. Okay, it's about 35 meters. We have a very, very strong beam where we use the micro beams. That will be the second part of my presentation. Then we can carry and transport the X-rays uh, in a satellite building, okay, where we use the monochromatic uh, X-ray beam, where we carry on different type of experiments, including imaging. So here we profit from the fact that the beam is quite highly coherent because we are the source is far away, okay. So is uh, and the four X-rays uh, have specific properties, uh, as I'm going to explain you in a few slides. Here again, more for the students, 
uh, we see the comparison of a conventional X-ray source, like an X-ray tube, versus a synchrotron bending magnet or a wiggler, which are the two type of uh, two of the three type of sources of uh, radiation in a synchrotron radiation facility, which you can see in the logarithmic scale that are several orders of magnitudes in intensity. And this is mainly the characteristic that makes synchrotron radiation particularly interesting for imaging. It's about 10 to the 6, 10 to the 8, more intense than any other medical X-ray generator. The X-rays are tunable. The beam is almost parallel, which makes life much easier when you do tomography, for instance. And this combination, the fact that this beam is very intense, the beam is parallel and so on, allows you to make micrometric and submicrometric and nanometric spatial resolutions. We now move to the one of the focus of my presentation, which is the phase contrast imaging. Okay, I start with the way that I explained to uh, the medical and biological students, and then I move to the uh, physics part. So first of all, let's take an image of an amber, which is under millions year old, okay, taken at the synchrotron with a given detector, a very good detector, okay. And we use the standard technique used also uh, at the hospital in the X-ray uh, laboratories and so on. You can see some, that there is something inside the, this, uh, this object, okay. But we use the conventional absorption image. We will see in a few slides what it means. Then we move to this with the same sample using the phase contrast image. And you see that are, are appearing a lot of different details embedded in, inside your sample that were absolutely invisible before. Okay. But now you start recognizing after you know what is inside. Okay. Good. So a second example, even more talkative perhaps. So using a medical CT, we made um, a, an, a scan of a Australopithecus sediba uh, published in Science, one of the oldest skull found in South Africa. Okay, and you can guess what is inside the skull. Again, if we move to synchrotron radiation, then you can define that this was a, a, a tooth and you can even measure the thickness of the tooth and the different internal layers of the tooth itself. Okay, so again, previous image and using the uh, synchrotron phase contrast image. You see, it's like giving a complete new light to your object, which is exact the way because is a completely different way to, of image formation. So let's go now more to the physics. Again, I take an approach like addressed to students. So if we have a free electromagnetic wave uh, moving in vacuum, okay, and we count uh, six periods, okay, for a given wavelength, then we move, we place a sample, uh, a cube, okay, of uniform material inside. We see two effects. The first effect is the fact that the amplitude of the way is diminished, okay, and this is the attenuate is what is called the attenuation of X-rays inside uh, the uh, the sample itself. And the second part is that to get a full number of periods, okay, I have to move a bit forward, okay, because there has been a phase shift. So the first part, so the, attenua the attenuation or the reduction of the amplitude of the wave is what we call absorption imaging and is strongly uh, correlated to the absorption coefficient of uh, in, uh, um, in the um, index of refraction. And the second part of this phase shift is the is due to the wavefront modification, okay, and is strongly correlated to the phase contrast detection. If we now go a bit more into the uh, mathematics, so again the wave amplitude is correlated to the uh, mu, which is absorption coefficient, which is a function of uh, lambda square, okay, in the total beta in the uh, refraction index is depends on lambda to the third power. While 
the refraction, the wave shift, is correlated to the um, real term of uh, the refraction index, okay? And the, uh, the energy dependence goes like a lambda square. And the total phase shift is the, just the integral, okay, of a delta uh, along the, the, uh, the path of the X-rays along the propagation. If you now make a plot of the energy versus the ratio delta over, beta, over beta, okay? So the two terms, the absorption and the fraction term, we see that the ratio goes from about 10 for low energies up to 1,000 uh, for the higher energies, okay? So it means that there is a very big advantage of using a contrast uh, coming, arising from delta rather than from beta. Okay, or better when the re ratio delta over beta is I. Okay, so what happens? If we go in a picture of uh, uh, the propagation of the, of the um, realization of the uh, propagation based phase contrast imaging, we have our sample, our uh, plane wave, which goes outside. Okay, and while the, the, the part which passes through the sample get the phase shift. And uh, along uh, on the borders of uh, the uh, unshifted and the shifted wave, you get a, the appearance of an interference pattern, okay? That of course propagates. And if you place your detector not so close to your sample, but you move a bit far away, you are able to distinguish the, um, the interference pattern, okay? Which is in this case, if you get uh, a standard one, or then you get plus or minus, okay, which makes you a pattern of white black on your image. And it's like, um, let's say, marking the borders of your object. Of course, this uh, applies the same if you have details inside your sample. And for each detail, you have the appearance of interfering pattern. And if you're sufficiently far away, and this distance depends on the energy and depends on the pixel side of your detector and other uh, another two parameters, okay, you will be able to distinguish the different part of the uh, diffraction. If we go in mathematical way, the intensity is proportional to the Laplacian of the phase, okay? While after post-processing, if you want to retrieve the original signal, okay, you have to apply a filtering in a Fourier, fast Fourier, we go better here. And you will see that the phase retrieval uh, can be done using different type of filters. The most famous, but not the only one, is Paganin. Then there is a Bronikov, then there are other ones, but this is largely the most used in the literature. You recognize some terms that we already uh, mentioned. So mu is the absorption coefficient, but also at the delta, okay? And at the end, it depends on the mu of delta. In other words, from beta over delta, which is the plot that I've shown you before, okay? But the anti-Fourier uh, transform. So again, to get phase retrieval, it depends on, and for the int overall intensity at the end, depends on this ratio, delta over beta. Good, let's have a look in practice. We put a semi-transparent plastic sphere in the beam. You get very, very nice uh, marks of the borders because you get the black and white due to the diffraction that occurs at the border of the object, okay? But if you have a more complex sample like a rat brain, okay, where the uh, phase variation is much smoother, okay, you don't see very much inside. But if you apply the phase retrieval, so with the Paganin filter, with the same image, you don't take again a second image, the same, you just apply the filter. You recognize now the different uh, details, much better, not only the border, but also the content. And the same, you recognize inside the rat brain. This is the overall theory of propagation phase contest imaging. Why I call it propagation phase contest imaging? Because it's one of the few different ways to 
record and to visualize the face contest imaging, the face contact inside the sample, okay? This is the, probably the easiest and the most used in the literature because you don't need any other additional optics, but just a good detector and the distance between the sample and detector and the almost a plane wave, very important. But there are other ways like the analyzer based system where you use a perfect crystal in between the sample and the detector. Grating based where you have a grating which fractionate your beam in multiple beams, okay? Or your non, um, um, diffraction based, uh, which is called the age uh, enhancing uh, system, which is has been invented by uh, Olivo and company in in uh, UK. But again, the overall you get very similar signal. Okay, but and in some cases they are proportional to the Laplacian, like in the propagation. Sometimes to the derivative, like the analyzer based and uh, the um, uh, the uh, age illumination. So to whom do we uh, have, to, who have to, to, to be uh, thanked for all this development? First of all, uh, Zernike and his Nobel Prize in 53 for the demonstration of the face contest method. Then uh, Mr. Gabor, okay, Nobel Prize in the 71 for the holography method. And then to other two guys, the Mr. Ansfield Cormack for the development of the tomography, because as we will see in a few minutes, the most important part of all this development is applied in 3D, in three dimension, in order to visualize inside the samples at very high resolution. So if now we try to apply in bioimaging, which is my field, uh, the challenges are always the same. So more contrast, less dose, please do faster, please increase the uh, resolution. I want to see uh, not only at uh, 10 microns, but also at three microns, but also some details at zero seven microns. But then, okay, when you, uh, when you are perfect in, uh, in uh, ex vivo samples, so you also want to move to in vivo. Uh, with all the motion artifacts due to the uh, breathing and the cardiosynchronous movements. And then you also want to do in an automatic way, the data acquisition and processing and so on. So along the, my 20 years at this ref, I tried to address quite all these points in different ways with different collaborators from all around Europe and the world sometimes, also from US in particular. And I will just summarize in the next slides, which is the progress in a quite historical way that we obtain uh, from the original. It was my, at the time of my PhD thesis in Trieste in Italy. We made the very first, and this was a pioneering work really made in 1996, 1997, okay, published in 1998. But we get the conventional radiography of uh, nylon wires, and using synchrotron radiation, monochromatic beam, and then on the right, the phase contrast image. You see a huge difference in that. Then we start immediately moving to the application mammography, which is, uh, was at that point the uh, most challenging application and the most requested application. And we wanted to demonstrate that the, this is able to better visualize lesions inside uh, the breast. And this then was the, the subject of a clinical trial uh, performed in Trieste that with a demonstration of that, but using uh, projection imaging. These are radiographs, are not computer tomography. I focus my uh, career on computer tomography. And here was one of the first interesting, very interesting uh, uh, results that we, we got in, the 19, in 2008, published in the best uh, journal that for rad radiography, which is the conventional CT of, uh, a, um, of a human uh, breast. And this is the uh, tumor site, okay, infiltrating inside. This is the fatty part. And this is the same image of the same sample. You can clearly recognize that is the exactly the same sample, but using the face contest technique, Okay, with a much less dose, 1.9 milligram. And this is the histology on it. Okay, you can perfectly match the histology with 
uh, the, um, the radiography, or actually the, the scanner. And this is why we, we, we invented at the time virtual histology. Okay, because we wanted to give a, a hint to, to the medical doctors what, what it means, uh, our capacity. And then up to reach what we did in uh, um, some years ago, that we were able to perform a full CT of a full breast, because the previous one was not a full breast for just a portion, um, with using two milligrays. Okay, and uh, seg uh, this is the full breast in 3D, and this is the segmentation of the tumor inside of the full breast. And this was published on PNAS as a, because this type of a dose uh, was absolutely a, a primer uh, for that. In parallel to breast, that um, was the original application of face contest also at other facilities, I started moving to musculoskeletal imaging, in particular because uh, medical doctors were keep saying that, okay, we need a, a tool that is able to do several things, not only breast imaging, that is absolutely important, but we need to be able to investigate inside the human body and some of them were very skeptical that face contact was able still to keep this face uh, signal after several centimeters of, uh, of uh, um, soft tissue or even bone. And this is why we moved in that direction. So this is a human patella cartilage. Again, is not a cat. This is a computer tomography at high resolution, eight microns, which is extremely important. This was a healthy one. You can see very intact bone below, okay, and the cartilage above, and you see very well the arc out the, the um, uh, protoglycan and the osteocyte are, 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 are built up inside the cartilage and matching with the histology on the left. But then what was really the, uh, the real challenges for us is to have a full uh, uh, human body that we image first at the hospital using conventional CT scanner. This is the femur, this is the patella, uh, and this is the tibia, okay? And this is the face contest image, but windowing only the bone, okay? So, uh, of course, a digital image, we window the bone and you see very well, which is the, um, the, uh, the, the parts where the bone has been uh, corrupted and uh, uh, is uh, osteoporosis uh, quite advanced in this uh, uh, post-mortem 86 uh, years old man. At the same time, you can also window uh, the, uh, the cartilage, which is absolutely the fundamental information to know the status of the osteoarthritis and the evolution of it, which is absolutely invisible in conventional image, okay, after windowing. But this, how does it challenge with the magnetic resonance, which is the standard in visualizing the, uh, the cartilage? The difference is that the, the cartilage in phase contrast are visible uh, in, and you can measure its thickness. You can also see the intra cartilage damage, but extremely important, you can see very well also the bone, which is not the case in magnetic resonance. And you see that this part, the subcontral bone has disappeared. So this is the part that is a clear sign from medical point of view that this part is absolutely damaged and, and very advanced osteoarthritis. We can do the same, this is again, this is full human knee, but with the actual view, where you can recognize all the parts, the ligaments, the uh, meniscus, tendons, and so on. So we shown that is extremely powerful for visualizing very thick uh, samples, uh, like a full human leg. In the uh, recent years, uh, we evolved quite a lot of our neuroscience because we were pushed by, uh, by the evolution of a neuro uh, degenerative disease. And in particular from the demand of uh, different user groups that wanted to study um, brain sclerosis or um, Alzheimer or Parkinson. And this is why in the last uh, five to seven years, I focused my attention mainly on neurodegenerative disease. 
Here you see an image courtesy of my friend Marco Stampanoni from Switzerland. And on the right side, you see the absorption image, again, taken with the synchrotron of a rat skull. Okay, sorry, rat brain, not rat skull. And on the left side, you see the phase reconstruction. This is the cortex of the, um, of the uh, mouse. And this is the hippocampus, which is the location where the memory is mainly uh, stored. And very fundamental is on the same dose. This boosted, this type of, uh, of results boosted the development of uh, uh, further development of the technique in order to follow up what happened after radiotherapy and we try to understand why some type of tumors are more radio resistant and or other types of tumors are less radio resistant and try to understand what happened after chemo at the administration of chemotherapy drugs, how the chemotherapy drugs um, attack part of, uh, um, of tumor and attack or do not, but a very higher solution at micrometric and submicrometric solution. So try to address very fundamental medical questions. So here we are again in a, in a rat brain. It is a three micron pixel size. And here are, we are navigating inside a, um, uh, I have to stop uh, the laser printer. Okay. And here we navigate inside the deep campus. Here we can see the white parts are the veins or, or capillaries, uh, while the, uh, the rest are the different layers inside the hippocampus. How does it compare this with uh, histology or magnetic resonance at nine Tesla, which is the highest you can put in, in vivo? And this is the face contest image on the left. And in the center, the uh, magnetic resonance image compared with the histological one. Again, we are quite virtual histology like. As I said, our main interest was to see what happened after radiotherapy and how to do that. We want to analyze and investigate inside the vessels because the vessels are one of the main target in particular for the, ta um, the target of, ter of radiotherapy and their destroyment is strongly correlated to the capacity of uh, uh, the uh, development of, of the tumor or a lot of different um, scientific cases uh, for neurodegenerative disease. This is the a mouse spinal cord. This tree looking like is the main artery and these are the veins, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the connection down to the capillary uh, bringing the, the, uh, the blood uh, to the border of uh, the spine. On the bottom left, you see an, a motor neuron in three dimension, okay, compared with histological results. So this is the fundamental point. We are able to visualize the same thing, not always. So there are some, of course, there are some limits, but same, very similar things to histology, but in three dimension, and we can reconstruct the full sample in 3D. Here again, here we uh, are marking only the motor neurons inside the spinal cord of a mouse. In this case, it was a normal mouse. And you can even count, of course, in automatic way, how many motor neurons have. And their disappearance of, the, of fewer number are a sign of evolution of, of a neurodegenerative disease. It is extremely fundamental if you want to apply a therapy like stem cells, for instance. Or in humans, human spine, this is the full human spine, uh, like a, again in a cadaver. And we are able to navigate inside the human spine to see uh, this is the uh, white matter, the black matter inside the human spine in a, in a healthy man. But this, we have a program to develop this for the study in a different stage of pathology in, uh, in, a, in a ILS, which is a type of uh, um, brain sclerosis, okay, and in Alzheimer, and we have another paper which is going out, because we are able to visualize the interface between the, um, the vascular uh, network 
and the neuronal network. And at this board, at this uh, interface, it is where the, the, uh, the therapy, but also the pathology develops faster. Another example, here we have um, a um, monkey eye. And we are navigating inside uh, the, um, the, um, uh, the retina. You see, these are the different, sorry, I need the pointer again. Okay. So here are the different layers of the retina, the seven layers. And, and this is the uh, visual nerve, okay, going inside. Okay, and this is a program done with a, a Russian group. But is this sufficient? No, no, because in, uh, we need to go uh, below the cellular scale that is able uh, to, that we can reach with uh, one or, or two micron pixel size, because motor neurons have a 20, 30 micron size. We want to go below. So we have to go to the nanoscale. And with the nanoscale, we are able to assess what happened in specific pathologies. In this case is a, a study, which was quite complex. I don't have the time, but I want just to give you the hint of what is possible. So we wanted to, to verify the number, different number of uh, um, uh, microvessels inside uh, the cortex of normal rats and pathological rats with a chronic pain. Okay, and we can go, we can have the high resolution uh, submicron uh, pixel size. And then we can go, of course, this is the much reduced uh, scale down of uh, 50 times, but the full resolution is this one. And we can count the four individual um, capillary uh, at different stages of the illness. And then we can calculate the number of segments, the number of vessels, the diameter of the vessels in a, in a semi-quantity, in a quantity way, in a semi-automatic way. And this gives you absolutely quantitative data that can be then um, uh, allows to, to really better understand what's going on. But again, if you go on an even further scale, we'll go to 100 nanometer scale, okay, we are able after segmentation to visualize this famous interface between the vessels, glial cells and neuronal cells and point option out. And we can visualize in 3D, okay? And their interaction inside the, the, the cortex. And this type of information is what exactly is fundamental to understand then what a therapy was able to do or not. Okay, I hope I was able to give you a good hint of the possibilities from microscale down to nanoscale. But then the problem remains when you have in vivo challenges. And uh, we had a long time <clears throat> program with uh, different collaborators from uh, uh, Helsinki uh, and Lund and Uppsala. Uh, which uh, who were uh, studying the, um, the acute respiratory distress syndrome that is at the end came out to be extremely important during the SARS-CoV-2 patients um, pandemia because is one of the, um, the way that unfortunately patient died at the end because they get a respiratory failure and bilateral um, incapacity of um, of uh, um, air exchange. So the problem is that you need to uh, image this type of samples in vivo, because of course there is no model, there's a significant model post-mortem. But in vivo, you have two challenges. One challenge is the respiration itself, uh, which of course is periodic, okay, is the signal, the increase of pressure inside the lungs, but also is the heartbeat. Okay, and both ones are uh, giving motion artifacts if you want to visualize the, um, the lungs at different uh, uh, size. You can stop one, which is the ventilation, because you can uh, have uh, the animal in apnea, and that still allows you to give uh, very good images and, and the significant images, but of course you cannot step the breath. So how to circumvent this way? So we um, invented a way which is called the retrospective gating, 
which means the following. So we take a lot of images uh, continuously and move the, the sample around, okay? And we have something like 50 or 60,000 images, okay? At the cost of the dose. So in every time you have to do a compromise. And then a posteriori, so the heartbeat determines a movement, okay? Of your local movement or your sample, okay? And then we a posteriori reconstruct the best uh, fitting position of the of the heart for each position of uh, angular position of your image. And therefore, we get a sequence of image, perhaps the first one after the uh, the um, heartbeat, okay, goes with the first one after the next heartbeat, okay, at the different angles. And then we reconstruct the sequence. In this way, if you have uh, everything is stable in time, of course, you have this hypothesis, you are able to circumvent the, um, the motion artifacts. Does it work? Does not work? Yes, this is called image registration in, uh, in uh, imaging. And this is this demonstration. So on the left, you see the respiration uh, at 11 micron pixel size of a rat in apnea. Okay, this is the heart, heart beating. Okay, but you can see almost individual the alveoli. On the right side, the same, this is the heart on the top left, but here we can see individually the alveoli. And we can even quantify whether the alveoli are opening or closing because not all alveoli open at the same time. So we were able to set up this tool for in vivo imaging. Okay. So then I move to rapidly to the second part. I will need uh, five, seven minutes to, to finish. And I will go, uh, I will skip a couple of slides, which are the um, introduction, but I go directly to the point. The point is that it's extremely difficult to uh, focus uh, the uh, radiation only on the target, which can be the tumor, okay, and to spare the healthy tissues which are around, okay? Why? Because X-rays, of course, penetrate and live constantly with the exponential uh, along the uh, their energy along um, the penetration, okay, and the larger the area that is radiated, the larger the damage is done. Mr. Lexel uh, in the 51 has invented the gamma knife exactly to circumvent these problematics and made a focusing the radiation from different zones, okay, in order that is only focused on the, um, on the target, which is a tumor, which is the isocenter of these holes, okay? But anyway, the smallest beam is about five millimeters in diameter. The point is, is there any other way to reduce uh, these beams and even increase the possibility to, uh, to control the tumor by sparing the normal tissues? Okay, the answer comes back from the 60s when Americans wanted to send the first astronauts in, in, in sky. And they started to try to reproduce in, uh, in, uh, in laboratory what happened with the, um, with the solar wind, with uh, the cosmic radiation. So they irradiated with a large beam, okay, with only, only under quote, under 40 grays, this uh, mouse uh, uh, cortex, and they got destroyed what was the tissue, okay, with the deutero. On the right side, they radiated much, much higher doses, okay, with a 25 micron beam. And they were able to transverse the beam, the, everything along the micro beam path was completely destroyed, but outside, everything is alive. And the overall structure of uh, the, uh, the, this uh, tissue, brain tissue, is conserved. These are very early uh, examples in the 60s. Then, when uh, synchrotron radiation, so X-rays become available uh, with intense uh, X-rays in the round under KV, we reproduce this in the late 90s. And you see again, 
the trace of the microbeam and along these black spots, which are dead cells, while outside are normal cells. This is an histology and everything was conserved. So what happened in practice? In practice that your dose is confined, okay? But of course there's a Compton scattering, which makes the, the dose also um, spread out from the peak to the, what is called valley in between two peaks. Because we cannot irradiate a tumor only with a very high dose, okay? We need, of course, we need an array, many microbeams at the same time. Otherwise, you cannot uh, hit a microscopic, um, um, a microscopic tumor. But the very first attempt using very high doses, you know, 300 grays, 300 grays, you destroy everything along the trace and you, uh, and you try to keep uh, the conserve in between, okay, gave very nice survival. And we were able, they were able, actually, I was not even joining at that point, able to keep alive 40% of the animals uh, having this uh, a very aggressive brain tumor. And this was very promising, okay? So what is the hypothesis? The hypothesis is that with this um, very strong microbeams, we act like a knife, knife that cuts the vessels and the micro vessels, while the um, bigger vessels, okay, the no, in particular, the normal ones, which are made by three different layers of endothelial cells can survive and they're, and they're kept. While the tumor vessels are much more fragile, okay, because they have a, a structure which is made fast by the tumor, okay, and they and have a single, a capillary-like uh, structure. And therefore, they are much easier to be uh, destroyed by radiation. So what we do, we radiate the, the tumor uh, with a dose, okay, which is the maximum tolerated dose in between two microbeams, okay, which is this uh, red line, okay, this is a dose uh, in, in vertical, while we give the very high doses along puff, 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 like a knife, cutting, slicing what is inside. And in between, everything survives. This is the, 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 the key point. Of course, there's a lot of physics behind it because you need to simulate first. And this is what we did with my student, um, Eric Zygman, uh, to simulate how the energy is deposited in a, in, a, in a brain. We tried to optimize which was the best energy in order to deposit, um, to confine the microbeam and not to spread out and not to get too much Compton outside, which is not the case anymore if you go to the one mega electron volts, but is very well confined if you keep 100, 150 kiloton volts. And the beams, and then you, you get the different profiles of the beams. We demonstrate using different Tanto Monte Carlo, Jean, Penelope. Penelope, uh, that the, the effects is given by the, uh, the, by the Compton, mainly the valley filling valley dose. And we have defined which are the best working conditions. If we compare with Lexel uh, original, uh, let's say um, machine, you see the blue profile, okay? While we have 50 microbeams in red in between. So we are 50 times uh, smaller each microbeam than, than the Lexel machine. Okay, we, how we create the microbeams using tungsten uh, collimator that we can move one in front of the other in order to create the microbeams of different sizes. We can create the microbeams, all right, this is a, a film. So we have each one is a microbeam, okay. Uh, you see the, the trace, they're all identical or semi-identical at the micrometric scale. We can give a very uh, exotic um, pattern. And this is the spectrum. The spectrum is centered around 100 kiloton volts and goes up to 500 kiloton volts. But this is the best part between uh, 70 and 150 kiloton volts. This is the setup okay, that we have where we place our sample, which is an animal, which can be a pig, which can be a dog. And this point we do veterinary and clinical trials and we radiate okay along this is micro this is the synchrotron radiation beam path okay i jump over a few parts but this is uh, the one of the most important 
we see that the microbeams you see have destroyed these capillaries, okay? But the main vein, okay, remains integer, as I told you. Why? If you radiate in a uniform way, you destroy everything, which is the bottom right. This is 20 grays and this is 200 grays, okay? 10 times less dose, you destroy everything if you uniform radiation. Okay, I go rapidly to the point because my I talk a bit slowly. This is the way that the tumor is irradiated. Of course, we do not only a single direction, we do a cross firing from two different directions in order to hit the tumor, which is this kind of center, okay? This is a real image of a tumor. And where we do, we try to um, combine this therapy with a nanoparticle, good nanoparticles in order to enhance locally the effect of radiotherapy, okay? And this is where we are developing right now in different directions in order to use also as a microsurgery. But what I wanted to, to say in a few, one more minute, we are moving toward the clinical application at synchrotron radiation because it's essential, okay? And the next step from my point of view is what I'm probably I'm going to do next uh, with my next job uh, at university is to focus on the complex sources, which is something between synchrotron radiation and the hospital that has not enough intensity. And you can irradiate probably a couple of patients a day, okay, with a much more compact source that are only 10 to 20 meters. Okay. So then I think I was able to, to show you the possibilities the synchrotron radiation gives for multi-scale imaging as a diagnostic tool, okay, even without any contrast agent, okay. And this allows to really study uh, the evolution of illness, diseases, okay. And at the same time, the, the same type of beam is able to visualize, to, to, um, uh, to uh, uh, be helpful in the treatment of uh, uh, very aggressive brain tumors. And I'm with obligado per lo serma ve al convite e per la sua attenzia. And I thank all my collaborators. Thank you, Albert. Alberto, very nice talk. Uh, we are open for questions. Please, Marcel, can you unmute? Uh, thank you, Robert, for uh, for the nice talk. Thank, thank for the presentation. Um, You're welcome. Regarding the energy and the applications, would that be feasible to perform those studies in, uh, at lower energies, uh, say in one of those uh, synchrotrons with uh, less, uh, uh, with an energy below uh, the 100 kilo electron volt limit? You're talking about the microbeam radiation therapy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think so. Uh, not for clinics, because otherwise you are unable to um, uh, to go through the skull, thick bone, so there's no way. But there's a lot of preclinics to be done, uh, in particular to understand which are the uh, biological mechanism uh, of this uh, tissue sparing. Okay, there are mechanisms uh, which uh, relates to express um, expression of uh, uh, proteins from genetic, um, from uh, the um, immune system. So there are genetic reasons. There is a, uh, something that is called bystander effect in biology. So it's something like a cells um, give signal to uh, die um, after the neighbor have been irradiated, so along the microbeam path, okay, and give what is called apoptosis, okay. Um, but the overall picture of why uh, there is this type of interaction and tissue sparing if when you go down in the volume is not clear. And I think um, in cells that there are several studies ongoing or also published in cells and in small animals, okay, 
can be uh, performed at uh, low energy synchrotron radiation facilities. You're welcome. We have time for more questions. Uh, I have a question uh, in the chat on YouTube uh, from uh, Italo Mendes. Just a curiosity, what detector are used to achieve such low pixel values? Okay. For, uh, um, let's say, um, down to 0 0.5 micron pixel size, we use uh, a PCO edge uh, detector. Okay, PCO is the company, edge is the type of detector, combined with a 10 times uh, optics the magnification. Okay, and this you can reach up to 0 0.6, 0 0.5 uh, microns pixel. If you want to go slow and uh, lower, okay, you need to we typically uh, make the beam uh, uh, focus and then diverge. So then we place the sample near the focus, okay? And then we use the projection. So it is a natural magnification of the beam after the focusing. And this allows you with a bigger pixel uh, to go down to, uh, to zero, 2, zero 1 uh, microns, okay? Otherwise, the even next step is that to use individual beams that have 20 micron, sorry, 10, 20 nanometers, okay, or 50 nanometers, and you make a raster scanning of your sample using this 50 nanometers. So there are different ways, depends on the type of samples. Uh, anyone have questions? I have one. Uh, it's related with the limitation of the face contrast image for non scale. Uh, I would like to know uh, what is the maximum limit for the sample size for this application? Well, uh, all depends on the on the sample size in 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 the tower big or tower small. <laughs> Uh, small. No. Small. Okay. Sorry. Um, uh, that was small. Is the the lowest is the beam size that then can be made uh, at the synchrotron radiation facility, which is about thirty nanometers. Okay, which is quite low. And this is the minimum that uh, at uh, this ref, but also at Petra Three in Germany, they are able to do. Okay. But of course, if you want to scan your sample with a 30 nanometer, you take a long. So then your, beam, your, your sample size is in the order of, I don't know, 100, 200 microns, okay? So then everything in practice scales with the, the, the pixel size that you want to reach. If you, want, if you don't want to explode with the time, because then it's only a matter of time, okay? you need to have a, a good compromise. So for instance, um, if you want a, a rat brain, which is two centimeter uh, diameter, you can go down to zero, zero 0.5 microns inside in the full one, okay? You do what is called local tomography without cutting. But if you want to go smaller, you have to, to slice it. I don't know if I reply to your questions, but uh, we need to, uh, I'm, I'm available to, to discuss a bit more in details case by case, because there is not a, only a general rule. Um, we don't have any questions. Well, I'm available to reply also offline in the next days if uh, the public has other questions. You know my my email, which was on the first slide as well. And I think I'm able to give you my, my slides if you want to publish. Okay. Uh, well, Alessandra, there is a question on, on the chat okay. yep. from Paulo Roberto Costa. 
he asks, in your opinion, what are the next steps and challenges for this PCI in the near future? For me, the challenges uh, in uh, uh, at synchrotron radiation facilities, the challenge is to perform a neuroimaging in vivo. And this is where I'm focusing in this, in this period. Uh, if we say in general, PCI, face contrast imaging in general, I think the next challenge is to the um, uh, outreaching the technique outside the synchrotron because we are too much synchrotron uh, radiation oriented. There are a few, um, as I said, um, trials to, um, to make machines which are running face contrast outside, like the in Munich, they have a two nice machines, but there are still some prototypes. So for me, the next challenge is to, um, to, um, to develop this at compact sources um, and like uh, what I mentioned, Atomics, which is under development in Paris. Uh, there is one in Italy, STAR, and the uh, second one in Munich as well, Kala, uh, is where um, with a cost which is uh, probably double than a magnetic resonance, but uh, 100 times smaller than a synchrotron radiation facility, uh, you can apply synchrotron, uh, you can apply space contrast image. And uh, that for me is uh, to become the really the, the ref is already the reference, but is only few accessible to the general public. Okay, uh, I think we don't have any questions. Uh, so I would like to thank you again for the excellent talk. And uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. It's a real pleasure for me and thank you very much to you again.